Hello everyone. Today is September 24th, 2015. I am Dr. Patricia Brown, OLA Director, and it is my pleasure to welcome Drs. Brian Hagen and Alyssa Resch to OLA Online Seminars to present Resources for the Three R's. Brian Hagen is a Health Science Policy Analyst at the National Institutes of Health, where he supports the NIH Report and Reporter Projects in the Office of Extramural Research. Previously, he was a Senior Scientist for Analysis and Evaluation at the NIH National Institute for Child Health and Human Development, where he co-led data management and data analytic projects for the National Children's Study. He received his Ph.D. in Microbiology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and his undergraduate degree from Bemidji State University in far northern Minnesota. Alyssa Resch, Ph.D., is the principal investigator of the National Human Genome Research Institute Sample Repository at Coriel Institute, a diverse collection of DNA samples and cell lines that has contributed to several landmark initiatives including the International HapMap and 1000 Genomes projects. Prior to joining Coriel, Alyssa was an assistant professor of genetics and developmental biology at the University of Connecticut Health Center. Alyssa earned her doctorate in biochemistry at the University of California, Los Angeles. Upon completion of her graduate degree, she was awarded a National Institutes of Health postdoctoral fellowship at the National Center for Biotechnology Information. Our webinar today is intended to inform IACUCs about resources their investigators may use to implement the three R's. Before we hear from Brian and Alyssa, I would like to speak for a moment about the three R's. The three R's are a strategy that was developed and published by Drs. Russell and Birch in 1959. Investigators are directed by the Guide for the Care and Use of Laboratory Animals to apply the three R's when designing their experiments. The strategy of the three R's is to replace animals with alternatives when possible, refine experiments to enhance animal well-being, and to reduce the number of animals needed. Let's discuss the three R's in more detail. Replacement means to find and use methods that eliminate the use of animals entirely and also to use less sentient animals when animals cannot be eliminated. Refinement refers to methods that increase animal well-being. This includes modifications to husbandry as well as experimental procedures. Measures that minimize animal pain and distress without compromising scientific research must be implemented. However, the guide acknowledges that in some types of studies there may be unforeseen or even intended experimental outcomes that do produce pain and or distress. The investigator and the IACUC must carefully consider ways to eliminate pain and distress while understanding that this may not always be possible. Reduction is the process of obtaining comparable information while using fewer animals and maximizing the data obtained from the animals used. This will, of course, minimize the number of animals used in the experiment. OLA expects IACUCs to consider the three R's in their review of protocols. While the PHS policy and the U.S. government principles don't mention the three R's by name, the concepts are conveyed in both of these guidance documents. The policy in Section 4C1 expects IACUCs to confirm that research with animals is consistent with the guide and the guide's endorsement of the three R's. U.S. Government Principle 3 is about reduction and replacement of animals, and Principle 4 describes refinements to minimize pain and distress. So now let's consider some examples of resources NIH supports that are available to assist investigators in applying the three R's as they plan their research. Now it is my pleasure to turn the podium over to Brian Hagen. Thank you for that introduction, Pat. I'm happy to be here to demonstrate a powerful set of tools offered by the National Institutes of Health called the Research Portfolio Online Reporting Tools, or REPORT. I'm going to show you today how you can use these tools to find researchers, 
projects, and publications that may help you apply the three R's. The primary reason for creating Report was to centralize reporting and create a one-stop shop for the public with consistent and reliable information on NIH programs. The NIH Reform Act of 2006 reinforced the importance of having this central resource and providing the public with the ability to search NIH-funded projects and retrieve information on publications and patents that have acknowledged that support. We are always exploring new ways to improve and streamline our reporting to communicate more effectively with the public. You can find Report by visiting report.nih.gov as seen on the upper right of the screen. Once here, you will find a variety of reports and tools available. Today, I'll focus most of our time on Reporter, which is available under the Quick Links tab on the left side of the screen. Before going any further, I also wanted to highlight that we have tutorials for the various parts of Report and Reporter, which you can find by clicking About Report and following the links down to the Tutorials section. Now I'd like to take you through a quick tour of Reporter. Reporter stands for Research Portfolio Online Tool for Expenditures and Results. This tool provides information on NIH's supported research projects, whether that research is happening in NIH facilities or in institutions across the U.S. and world. Also included is information on projects supported by other organizations within the Department of Health and Human Services and the VA. When you arrive at Reporter, you'll see we have a comprehensive search form, and I'd like to orient you to the key features. First, by default, Reporter only searches for active projects. But you can adjust this by clicking the Select button and choosing any or all of the last 25 years. The next section is the Researcher and Organization section, where you can search the name of a person, the name of an organization, as well as other details like the state or congressional district where the grants were awarded. Below that, we have our text search area, where you can search the titles and abstracts of the grant awards, as well as the text of the resulting publications. Next, we have the project details section, which focus on, focuses on the more administrative details. The most common searches here are to search for a specific project number you are working with, or searching for projects that are associated with a certain program officer or review panel at the NIH. Below that are some additional items related to specific NIH policies, but don't have general use for our discussion today. Now I'd like to take you through an example of a text search, which is one of the most common types of searches on Reporter. First is the box where you can enter your search terms. Then we have the search targets, where by default you search against projects but you can also search against the text of publications and news releases that are associated with NIH projects. To the right, we then have options that let you target your project text searches against just the title, terms, or abstracts of those projects. If you are searching against publication text, you can control what years of publications will be searched. When entering search terms in the box, the default is for a reporter to look for projects that contain all of those terms, which we call AND logic. For this search, I'll imagine I'm looking for someone to help advise me on my zebrafish model of fetal alcohol syndrome and do a simple search for those words. I placed fetal alcohol syndrome in quotes to make sure all three words will appear in that order in any of my results. Now that we have this simple search configured, we click Submit Query here on the upper left of the search screen. Once the query is complete, Reporter will return your list of matches. We can see the project number, the title, the principal investigator, the organization, and the agency that funded the research, and how much funding is currently being used. If I click a title, I can read the project abstract and learn more about the project. 
going back to my example of finding experts to help me with my zebrafish model, this list is likely uh, does include some of the right experts, but the list may be too short, and I may need to reach out to a broader set of folks. So I can go back to the query form and refine my search criteria. So let's take another look at this query and try a more inclusive set of terms using the advanced search. We can use this option by clicking the radio button and adding my search terms. I'll look for projects that mention either alcohol or fetal alcohol syndrome while still mentioning zebrafish. Note that I'm using the Boolean operators or and and as well as parentheses around my or statement. That results in 28 projects better than just four. We can expand it even further to include zebrafish projects that mention toxicity or toxicology by using the percentage symbol as a wildcard character. With that, any word starting with toxic will also be matched. In summary, advanced text search allows Boolean operators like and, or, and not, parentheses to define search clauses, and the percentage wildcard to expand word matching. Now I'd like to go through uh, some of the more advanced features of the search results page. There are several tabs of information about what's on the hit list. First is the list of projects with links out to the administrative and scientific details about the awarded projects, which I showed earlier, and here's another view of an abstract page. Next is the publications tab with a list of publications that were supported by the projects on the first list, and we can follow out links to read more from PubMed or other sources. We also display any patents that have been linked to NIH awards by the grantees. Next over are the clinical studies that are linked to NIH grants through clinicaltrials.gov, and you can follow a link to read the details of those studies. For large lists of projects, we offer tools to visualize the characteristics of your search results on the Data and Visualize page. You may want to view summaries of your hit list by the funding agency, the investigator, or the organization. We also offer the Circles tool, which allows you to explore the terms and concepts used in the project descriptions. Next over is the Map tool, where you can explore where this research is being conducted and you can zoom in to view the results within particular states. Last, we have the News and More tab with links to other documents where these research projects have been mentioned, like this news release from Scripps. You can share your search criteria by email or otherwise by sharing a unique link to a reporter. Every time the link is followed, the search criteria will be rerun on Reporter and the most up-to-date results returned. Finally, you can export all your search results. By default, you will export all results when you click the Go button, but you can also click these checkboxes along the side to select just the projects you are interested in getting the details for. Clicking the Go button will launch a new window where you can set your download options. And once things are config configured the way you like, you can click Export and open the file in Microsoft Excel or other tools. Now I'd like to take you through the features of my reporter, which enables you to save your common queries and receive emailed updates for your saved searches. At the top of the reporter search page, there is a register button, and you can click this button. You will see a pop-up window where you can enter your email address and preferred password. We also need you to do a verification step, and then click register. The reporter website will send you an email with a confirmation link to activate your account. This is what the confirmation request email will look like. You can click Confirm, 
and My Reporter will launch in your browser and you'll receive a message that your account has been confirmed and you can then log in using your registered email address and your password. You are then taken to the My Reporter dashboard where you can launch a new query. You'll be taken to the query screen, but the reporter logo will be replaced with the My Reporter logo to let you know that you're logged in. So now we can do a simple search, say for osteoarthritis. and get our results. Now, in addition to all the capabilities we had before, we now have the option to save the query here at the top. After clicking Save Query, you're taken to a new screen where you can give your saved query a name and choose to receive email updates when there are new projects, publications, or news releases associated with this saved query. Now our search criteria have been saved and are listed on our dashboard. We can return to the dashboard at any time to run the search by clicking the arrow, and you can also delete the query or adjust your email preferences. Once a week, re my reporter will send you an email with any new items that match your saved queries. And you can follow links from the email to see all items that match your search or just the new items. So in summary, My Reporter allows you to automatically monitor your portfolio by using saved queries and emailed updates. Next, I'd like to take you through Matchmaker, which offers another way to search projects listed in Reporter. With this tool, you can search with the full text of a document you might be working with, say an animal protocol, a research abstract, or other scientific text, and find similar NIH projects. Matchmaker is available from the Reporter homepage on the rightmost tab. The Matchmaker search interface is just one box. Just copy and paste your scientific text into the box. For instance, you might use a conference abstract, a research statement, or other scientific text up to 15,000 characters. Here, you can copy and paste it in your text, then click Submit. In the background, Reporter is analyzing your text for key terms and concepts and matching those against the key terms and concepts used in the abstracts of funded NIH research. Once this comparison is complete, Matchmaker will return the 100 most similar projects as well as display a graphical bar chart summary of the results by NIH Institute or Center, Activity Code, or Study Section. Below the charts, projects are listed in decreasing similarity, as indicated here by the match score. From this page, you can refine your set of results by clicking the relevant bar chart. For instance, you may wish to look only at similar R01 projects. Just click the R01 bar. Now the bar charts have been refreshed to show where similar R01 projects were reviewed and which institute or center made the award. You can drill down even further to a single IC, like NIMH, and restrict the results further. You can explore your results by clicking on the project titles to read the abstract, or click on the project number to learn more about the funding details of the project. If you are an investigator interested in applying for grants, you can also click to see the program officer's email address. You can also export all of your results, just like you can do for any reporter hit list. In summary, Matchmaker is a tool to find similar projects based only on scientific text. Finally, I wanted to make you aware of another tool we have in development, which is called Federal Reporter. Part of the Star Metrics initiative among five key agencies, this tool lets you search across the research portfolios of several agencies, including the NIH, the National Science Foundation, the USDA, the EPA, the Department of Defense, and others. You can find this tool at federalreporter.nih.gov as seen in the upper right hand. 
As a quick example, we can search for Prairie Dog, and we find four projects in 2014, including projects from USDA in their Agricultural Research Service and their Institute on Food and Agriculture, as well as projects from the National Science Foundation and the NIH. Thank you. With that, I'll turn things over to Alyssa Resch from the Coriel Institute. Thank you, Brian. Before discussing the sample collections housed at Coriel, I would like to provide background about the history of the Institute. Coriel is a nonprofit biomedical research institute founded by Dr. Louis Coriel in 1953. Early in his career, Dr. Coriel succeeded in optimizing techniques to sustain living human cells in culture free from contamination. This breakthrough allowed scientists to grow the polio virus and work toward the first vaccine. For over 60 years, Coriel has demonstrated achievement in cell culture technology and developed standard practices in cell characterization and cryopreservation. Many of the samples housed at Coriel are used as gold standards and reference sets in the scientific community. Coriel is a basic biomedical research institute committed to genetic research, biobanking, and education. Coriel is home to several large biorepositories that rank among the world's largest collection of living cells and DNA used for human and animal research. We operate a fully funded IPSC laboratory and stem cell biobank containing human and mouse lines Coriel is known for its expert staff and pioneering programs in the fields of genetics, cell biology, and personalized medicine. We strive to provide the highest quality biomaterials and are certified to the ISO standard for quality management. Coriel is recognized as a leader in biobanking. We are at the forefront of many exciting developments in the fields of personalized genomics, genetics, and stem cell biology, and have been recognized for these efforts. These developments would not be possible without Coriel's biorepositories, which contain more than 7 million samples collected over 60 years. In 1959, Dr. Coriel recognized the value of collecting and preserving biospecimens in anticipation of advanced research discovery techniques. The NIH also saw the value in this practice and in 1964 partnered with Coriel to create the first standardized cell repository in collaboration with the National Institute of General Medical Sciences, or NIGMS. Originally launched in 1972, the NIGMS repository contract at Coriel is the longest uninterrupted contract at the NIH. Coriel's publicly accessible biorepository contains a diverse collection of sample types from humans and animals. Collections are organized by species, disease type, mutation type, data type, and by population. For example, we distribute cell lines and DNA samples from numerous species, including humans, non-human primates, mouse, cow, dog, and hamster, to name a few. Our collection also includes samples donated from individuals with a variety of confirmed diseases, including neurological, age-related, heart, eye, and immunodeficiency diseases. Coriel is home to the largest inherited disease collection in the world, and samples in this collection include known genetic mutations, chromosomal abnormalities, and cancers. Many of the samples in our collection are accompanied by rich phenotypic, clinical, and next-generation sequencing data sets. Coriel hosts the largest collection of human populations in the world, including samples collected for the International HapMap and 1000 Genomes projects, comprised of samples from 27 unique populations. 
Next generation sequencing and genotyping are also available for these samples, making it one of the largest open access data sets with companion cell lines and DNA. The repository is organized by collections and services. The boxes across the top row show the types of repositories housed at Coriel. We store and distribute thousands of samples for our large NIH repositories, which include the National Eye Institute, National Human Genome Research Institute, National Institute on Aging, National Institute for General Medical Sciences, and the National Institute for Neurological Disorder and Stroke. We are home to several nonprofit collections, including the American Diabetes Association and the Huntington's Disease Foundation. An important Coriel-owned collection is the Integrated Primate Biomaterials and Information Resource, or IPR, which includes cell lines and DNA samples from multiple non-human primate species. Coriel offers a wide range of custom services as illustrated on the bottom row. Custom services are offered by our cell culture, stem cell, molecular biology, and genotyping and sequencing laboratories. Coriel's genotyping lab is CLIA certified and our stem cell lab grows and distributes both human-induced pluripotent stem cells, or iPSCs, and mouse embryonic stem cells. We offer a variety of safe storage options for short and long-term storage. Popular testing services include DNA fingerprinting for sample identification, karyotyping for chromosomal analysis, pluritest for stem cell characterization, and qPCR. Coriel's collections are organized by repository, and the descriptions of several large repositories are shown in the last column. The funding organization for each repository is shown in the first column. Information about grant and contract award numbers is shown in column two, and the award number for federally funded grants and contracts can be entered into NIH Reporter. Animal cell lines, DNA samples and stem cell lines are maintained and distributed for several collections on this list, including NIGMS, NIA, the Jackson Laboratory Collection, the Yerkes Primate Resource, and the Integrated Primate Biomaterials and Information Resource. This screenshot from the National Institute on Aging webpage highlights the animal models used for aging studies that are available from the NIA repository. Biospecimens from many animals, including panda, dog, cow, pig, rabbit, horse, non-human primates, and several rodents are distributed by the repository. The NIA collection also includes mouse embryonic stem cell lines. Coriel's collections are not limited to the NIH. We also partner with other government agencies and disease foundations to build, maintain, and distribute their collections. Examples of government organizations not previously mentioned include the National Cancer Institute, National Science Foundation, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and the U.S. Immunodeficiency Network. In addition, we host several important disease foundation collections from the Huntington's Disease Foundation, American Diabetes Foundation, Autism Research Resource, and the Wistar Institute. Coriel's biorepositories distribute a wide range of sample types as shown here. Human and animal genomic DNA, RNA, and cell lines are widely distributed, as are biofluids, such as saliva, whole blood, plasma, serum, urine, and cerebrospinal fluid, which are important for human biomarker studies. A variety of normal and tumor tissue and cell lines are also included in these collections, as are transformed B cells and polyclonal and monoclonal antibodies for immunological studies. Other sample types include purified proteins, plasmid mini-genes, and mouse and human stem cell lines. 
Coriel's biorepositories are equipped with state-of-the-art freezers and cryogenic tanks armed with temperature monitors and alarms. Our collections are stored in multiple fail-safe storage locations, and our repository inventory management system, or RIMS, allows for real-time inventory management. Our stem cell laboratory maintains a large collection of human-induced pluripotent stem cell lines for reprogramming, expansion, and cryopreservation. Our lines undergo extensive quality control and characterization measures, including surface antigen testing, pluritest gene expression analysis, G-banding karyotype analysis, and genotyping. The stem cell lab also grows and characterizes most embryonic stem cells. We recently launched the world's largest collection of publicly available human iPSCs for disease studies, funded by a $10 million grant awarded by the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, or CIRM. CIRM was established to accelerate stem cell research in California through establishment of a $3 billion fund approved by taxpayers. Tissue samples collected from patients suffering from Alzheimer's disease, autism spectrum disorders, liver disease, cardiovascular disease, neurodevelopment mental disorders, including cerebral palsy and epilepsy, respiratory disease, and diseases of the eye were used to build the collection. Coriel is collaborating with Cellular Dynamics International to create and distribute three iPSC lines for each of the 3,000 healthy and diseased donors who participated in the study. In addition to establishing, maintaining, and distributing cell cultures and DNA samples from our biorepositories, Coriel offers a wide array of research services. Services offered by our cell culture laboratory include isolation and cryopreservation of peripheral blood mononuclear cells, or PBMCs. Epstein-Barr virus transformation of PBMCs for establishment of immortalized lymphoblastoid cell lines, establishment of primary fibroblasts and differentiated cell lines from biopsy, growth of cell lines for isolation of DNA and RNA, and expansion of cell lines for distribution, stock maintenance, and molecular and cytogenetic analysis. Successful long-term maintenance and cryopreservation of cell lines is crucial for our repositories since cell lines serve as a renewable source of DNA. Services offered by our molecular biology lab include isolation of genomic DNA, total RNA, and microRNAs from blood, cells, and tissues, large-scale propagation of transfection ready plasmid DNA, genotyping with highly polymorphic microsatellite markers using multiplex fluorescent PCR, and pedigree verification and cell line authentication. Hemoglobin testing of biofluids, including plasma and serum, and mycoplasm testing using real-time PCR. Coriel operates a CLIA-certified genotyping and microarray center and is one of the largest microarray facilities to offer genome-wide genotyping. The lab is CLIA-certified in 50 states and offers a variety of services, including mRNA and microRNA expression profiling, copy number variation analysis, and custom genotyping panels. Our Affymetrics platform has capacity for two to 3,000 samples per month. We also offer targeted DNA or RNA sequencing using the Ion Torrent PGM platform. Coriel can accommodate sequencing experiments for multiple organisms. Affymetrics offers over six dozen types of arrays, and a subset are shown here. Coriel has experience running several types of human arrays, mouse and rat arrays, the Drosophila gene array, and arrays for E. coli and P. aeruginosa, to name a few. 
Many of the samples in our biorepository include samples collected from individuals with confirmed disease mutations or chromosomal aberrations. These samples require cytogenetic analysis for further characterization. Services offered by our cytogenetics laboratory include G-banded karyotype analysis, analysis of copy number variation and loss of heterozygosity using the Affymetrics genome-wide human SNP array, fluorescence in situ hybridization analysis, including probe design, labeling, purification, and validation, and application of cytogenetic and cytogenomic services for stem cell studies and transgenics quality control. Coriel maintains a state-of-the-art online catalog that contains a complete inventory list of all publicly available samples and provides a platform for placing online orders. This is a screenshot of Coriel's online catalog homepage. The URL for accessing the catalog website is shown at the top. The catalog has a powerful search engine and samples can be searched for by repository, collection type, sample type, disease name, species name, or sample ID. Links to our biorepository collections, laboratories, and custom services department are included at the bottom of the page. It is easy to order samples from Coriel. Our samples are used by scientists affiliated with academic, government, nonprofit, and commercial organizations. These three steps should be followed when placing an order. One, identify the repository that contains your sample or samples of interest. Two, click on the sample ID to retrieve information about the sample. And three, fill out the required paperwork, which includes a statement of research intent and material transfer agreement specific to the repository from which the sample is ordered. Your order can be placed through Coriel's online order, ordering system or by speaking directly with our customer service department. Our toll-free number, international number, and email address are shown at the bottom of the slide. Coriel strives to keep sample prices reasonable as part of our mission to advance scientific research. Tiered pricing for academic and commercial organizations as well as bulk discounts are offered by some repositories. Sample prices vary depending on the repository from which the sample is ordered. Information about sample prices can be obtained by clicking on the sample ID. Examples of popular product types include live or frozen cell cultures, cell pellets, DNA aliquots, DNA panels, and DNA plates. Custom orders or special orders can also be placed with our customer service department. The snapshot shown on this slide is taken from the NHGRI repository and provides an example of sample prices for DNA cell lines and other sample types distributed by the repository. Pricing information is clearly defined by contract and sample type. Samples are accompanied by detailed information including characterizations, phenotypic data, relevant publications, and more. If you have specific questions about our samples or collections, you can contact the principal investigators and project managers that manage each of our repositories by clicking on the Mission and Organization tab under each repository. Our phone numbers and email addresses are listed here, and we are happy to help however we can. Thanks for tuning in today, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Brian and Alyssa, for your excellent presentations. How can NIH Reporter and its tools and the Coriel Institute and its resources be useful? Here are just a few ideas. Reporter can be used to identify similar or complementary models that may replace a current animal model. Reporter can also assist in identifying refinements that minimize pain and distress. 
Reporter may help investigators in finding collaborators and eye cooks in finding subject matter experts. The Coriel Institute repositories offer investigators alternatives to the use of live animals, which may also reduce the cost of con conducting their experiments. We do have some time for some questions. We'll start with questions that we have on hand and then move to those received during the webinar. Please submit your questions through the GoToWebinar question box on your screen. We will accept questions for up to two weeks and amend them to the transcript of the recorded webinar. So as you think of questions, go ahead and submit them now or at a later time. First question, does OLA expect investigators to use NIH Reporter and the Coriel's resources exclusively? No. While NIH produces Reporter and supports many of the Coriel's repositories, use of these resources is optional. As we learn from Brian and Alyssa, these resources offer valuable information that may be useful in identifying collaborations, finding subject matter expertise, and obtaining samples as an alternative to the use of live animals. Reporter and Coriel are examples of the types of resources that may be used to implement the three R's. There are many other ways to find this type of information, including literature searches, as we highlighted in the OLA's June 2014 webinar. Question two. Would searching NIH Reporter or Federal Reporter qualify as an alternative search to meet Animal Welfare Act regulation requirements? Maybe. NIH and Federal Reporter provide valuable information about research models, and NIH Reporter includes publications resulting from NIH-funded research. Their usefulness in finding alternatives to painful address or distressful procedures, procedures has not been evaluated. It's an interesting idea that may be best explored with the help of your institution's librarian. Ultimately, it's the effectiveness of the search itself that matters. Question three. This is a question for Brian. What other features do report and reporter offer that might be of interest to investigators? Uh, well, there's three examples that I'd like to point out to you. Uh, there's our NIH Awards by Location and Organization tool, which can simplify the process of finding NIH-supported projects in particular states, at particular organizations, or particular types of institutions like schools of veterinary medicine. We also have the NIH Data Book, which summarizes uh, the most frequent questions that we get about trends in research funding and success rates. Finally, we have the NIH Funding Facts site, which offers quick quick access to statistics from the NIH data book and a variety of other annual reports produced by NIH Office of Extramural Research. Question four. Must an investigator have an NIH grant to procure samples from Coriel? So this one is for Alyssa. Uh, no. Uh, our biorepository samples are available for purchase regardless of the funding arrangements that the principal investigators have. Um, while procurement requirements vary across collections, all investigators must at minimum complete a material transfer agreement form and a statement of research intent. And these documents uh, just ensure that the research intent aligns with the goals of the repository, but these are actually reviewed by repository staff before the samples are shipped out. Thank you. Must IACUC's review requests when investigators obtain items from Coriel? No, IACUC review is not required when animal tissue or other materials are obtained from repositories like Coriel. However, some institutions may have animal biosecurity policies that require review of biological products to be administered to animals or that are classified as biohazards, and that would be made at the local institutional level. 
We are now going to accept questions that have come in uh, during the webinar. We do have a few. The first question is, how do IACUCs resolve the conflict between reduction and refinement? For example, 15 painful or distressful measurements on three animals versus three measurements on 15 animals. Both will give 45 data points. Well, I'm going to refer the, uh, the questioner to the guide, and the guide on page 5 uh, goes into some detail about this idea that refinement and reduction goals should be balanced on a case-by-case -case basis, that investigators are encouraged from advocating animal reuse as a reduction strategy, and that the rationale for re re reusing an animal or animals that have already done experimental procedures, especially if the well-being of the animals would be compromised, should be seriously considered. So. I think this is really is a case-by-case -case determination by the IACUC based on the invasiveness of the procedures and uh, the outcome that it may have on the animals uh, if those uh, procedures are repeated. Now we have a question for, for Brian. Will uh, the reporter utility be replacing the search of scientific literature on PubMed Central? Will it draw from the same database of literature? And if PubMed Central will continue to exist, please clarify how its literature databases, database differs from reporter. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, PubMed Central is, will continue to exist and grow. Uh, reporter only searches the text of NIH supported publication and gets that publication data from PubMed. Searching PubMed or PubMed Central uh, will generally result in a lot more results, while results in Reporter will have a direct connection to NIH funding. An example of how this might be helpful is if you want to find collaborators that are already supported by the NIH and they have published on a certain topic that might not have been mentioned in their NIH grant abstract. Okay, we have another question for Brian. Are other NIH search tools, such as QVR and Spires, available to other federal agency scientists? QVR provides more in-depth data not available through Reporter. Uh, yes, uh, s well, uh, s Reporter makes use of the Spires database in order to connect um, publications to the NIH projects, but the Spires application itself um, is not available outside of the NIH firewall. Uh, the QVR tool does provide more in-depth data, but much of that data is proprietary, and so you'd have to have a particular uh, uh, job role in order to gain access to that database. Um, you can send us an email address uh, and we can put you with, in contact with the people that might be able to help you with that. Well, we have no more questions coming in, but we've received a number of kudos for both Brian and Alyssa complimenting on uh, what wonderful resources these are and, and how um, wow, wowed people are from learning about them. So at this point, we have no more questions, so we're going to go ahead and um, come to the end of our, of our time together. Uh, if we didn't get your question, or if you come up with a question at a later time, we will be compiling uh, questions and uh, adding them to the transcript. Uh, we'll, we'll ask our speakers to answer those questions. If you think, as I said, of more questions in the next two, two weeks, please send them to OLA. We will include them in the transcript, as I've said. You're also welcome to call or write us with questions at any time. Uh, the two-week deadline is only for inclusion in the transcript. Our next OLA seminar will be a question and answer session with the OLA senior staff, including personnel from the Divisions of Compliance Oversight, 
assurances, and policy and education. We will need time to prepare the webinar, so please send your questions as soon as possible, no later than November 13th. We look forward to hearing from you about the issues you are interested in, so get those questions to us at oladpe at mail.nih.gov. Thanks for your participation today, and we look forward to meeting with you again on December 3, 2015.